your name. Uh, we exalt your name, Jesus, as the name above every name. And we declare you as our Lord, our Savior, the captain of our salvation, our provider, our healer, our redeemer, our strength. Everything that we need exists in you, Lord. And so we thank you. We thank you that you've welcomed us in, brought us in uh, to the kingdom of God and um, that you pay such a steep price to do that. We thank you for that, Lord. And uh, <clears throat> our prayer, our desire is that you would live through us in this earth, that you would live through us, that we would represent you well, that we would walk the way you walk, that we would talk the way you talk, Lord, that we would love the way you love, that we would see the way you saw, Lord, we thank you for that, God. Live in us, live through us. And we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. So uh, I'm going to start off. We're going to talk about something tonight, um, something that we talked about a little about, about a year ago. Uh, we're going back to the spiritual warfare uh, thing that God had us on. Um, but you know, I want, I want to, I want you to put a thought in your mind right now. I want you to think about your, one of your favorite meals that you like to eat like me. I love me some steak and shrimp straight up. Love me some steak and shrimp. Um, and when I think about that steak and shrimp, I could go eat some tonight. And then two weeks from now, I'd be like, I want some more steak and shrimp. You know what I'm saying? And then another month after that, you know what? I think I want me some steak and shrimp. Once you find a good meal, you don't eat it just one time. How many of y'all got a meal you love and you only ate it one time? Are y'all, am I coming through the mic? Okay. Um, you don't. You don't usually find a meal you love and eat it one time. You eat it, you know, frequently. Uh, you know, every so often you eat that meal. Well, that's, that's what this is like. Today, the things I'm going to talk about, a good portion of it is stuff that we talked about when we were going through this series. Um, but I'm going to be bringing it up again. And so you're going to be sitting there saying, 
yeah, okay, we just heard about this. Well, what are you doing? What we just heard about this? Well, it's a good meal. Let's eat again. Amen. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna add some different flavor to it and make some different points that what uh, were uh, than what were made before. But we are gonna talk about that. And I, I just feel like God is the long and short of it is, is God wants to keep this on our mind every so often just to bring it up and remind us because he, he said we're going to have to be ready to do this warfare for a reason. Amen. And it's easy for us as people to get a word and be like, man, that was a good word. And then three months from now, it's way in the back of your mind. You ain't necessarily forgot about it. Sometimes you forget about it, but it's way back buried in, in the deep back of your mind. And we don't remember sometimes to apply it to our daily life today. So I feel like that's what God is wanting us to do. Amen. So we're going to talk about it, like I said, spiritual warfare. So let's open up your Bible to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to go two places, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 10 first. Uh Verse 3 and 4 says, now get this, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So there's an acknowledgement here that we live in the flesh, in this physical flesh here, as well as in this world. I think it's also talking about the world. Amen. And uh, so it's acknowledging that we live in this flesh, we live in this world. But it also says, but we do not war after this world. Amen. We don't war after the flesh. There's another way we do this. And let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. All right. Uh, We're going to look at one verse, uh, verse 12 right now. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So these two things make it very clear that we are in a war, but what we fight with is not a natural thing. Amen. It's a spiritual it's a spiritual battle. And we if it's a spiritual battle, we got to fight with spiritual weapons amen spiritual tools um you cannot fight a spiritual weapon with natural tools it just ain't gonna work you can silence the person that's giving you grief that's working as an agent of satan but guess what as soon as you silence him satan will find somebody else so um so yeah so those are the foundation scriptures here for this uh that we're going to talk about now, first thing I want to do is talk about some of the, uh, the, t- the Satan strategies, some of the ways that he comes at us. Uh, that's what we're going to start at tonight. So um, there, there are two things we need to know when we or a couple of things we need to know about his strategies. So first thing we need to know, uh, turn to your Bible to Colossians chapter one. Um, is that Satan, to- Toya mentioned this and Pastor Taylor mentioned this when they did the class, their classes when they spoke about this. Uh, Satan does not move from a position of authority. We need to understand that. He does not move a pos- from a position of authority. If he had authority, if he was powerful, he would just overcome us. He'd overrun us, r- overrun us right? Well, he doesn't have that type of authority. We need to understand that. Um, So again, Colossians chapter one, verse 13 says here, uh, who has delivered us, or actually I'll read 12, uh, giving thanks unto the father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us in the kingdom of his dear son. So he delivered us from the power of darkness. That means couple things here first of all before he delivered us we were uh we were subject to the powers of darkness amen and but because of what jesus did he has delivered us from so that's one reason why we can know that he does not move from a position of authority 
because Jesus has taken us away from that. Amen. Y'all understand that? Amen. And then also let's go over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And this is really a, a, a contrary, you know, on, on the other side, the flip side of the coin. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 26 is what we're going to look at. Uh, I'm going to start at verse 25, really it says in meekness. So this is Paul writing to Timothy, giving him instructions on how to conduct himself. Amen. And he says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So he's talking about him ministering to people who are unsaved, right? Because they need to repent. So in verse 26 says, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, like he did with us, who are taken captive by him at his will. So you see there, if you are not born again, you have not experienced that liberty, that liberation from Jesus. And so you are taken captive by him at his will. Um, we're not going to go into it. That does have some limitations. But all in all, if you are not born again, you are taken captive by him at his will. But we are born again. So Satan cannot move in your life from any type of position of authority. He cannot. He can only do what we allow him to do. And that's important to realize. Satan cannot move from a position of authority. Amen? Amen. Y'all all right out there? Okay. So, um, so if he can't move from a position of authority, then that means he needs to come at us a different way. Amen? Uh, so let's look at Ephesians. Chapter, back to Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> so uh, get what it says here. It says put on the whole armor of God. Verse 11. I'm sorry. Verse 11. It says put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles there. It, the definition is uh, cunning arts, deceit, craftiness, and trickery. So this is how Satan comes at us. He can't overpower us. He can't overtake us. But he comes in sneakily. He comes in crafty. He tricks us. He does things to trick us and deceive us. That's how he comes at us. We need to understand that. Amen? That's how Satan comes at us. He is not coming from a position of authority. He comes in to trick us. That means he needs to, to pull the wool over our eyes to make, basically to make us think he has more influence than he has. Makes the situation seem worse than it actually is. Makes us feel like there is no hope. Man, how are we going to do this? That's how he has to come at us. Amen? So uh, that's the first couple things. Next, I, I'm a, I just want to, I just wrote these down on the paper. Um, Satan's main strategies, the main ways that he comes at us. Now, obviously, he comes through wiles, through trickery and whatnot. But some of the main ways, he comes through temptations. Amen. Temptations to sin or temptations to do, even if it's not sin, do something that's um, not necessarily sin. You ain't stealing something, but you're doing something that's outside of the will of God, for example. So he comes at us through temptations. He comes at us through distractions. He comes at us through deception and then through offenses. Those are some of the main strategies, the main strategies he uses to come at us. Um, now, on the other hand, he does do things like attacks our health. He'll attack our finances. Uh, he'll bring attacks on our character to try and discredit us, to make us unable to be effective in the kingdom of God. Uh, and then, of course, he comes through persecutions. None of these still are from a position of authority. We still have the right and the authority to deal with that, to put him in his place, to cancel those actions and those plans that he has for us. Amen. But that is the way he comes. He can come at you and uh, make you sick, for example, make you sick and 
we got a choice to make. Are we going to believe the symptoms that we're feeling? Or are we going to stand on the word of God? You see what I'm saying? Uh, we still have a right, even if he comes at us, to say, uh, no, devil, I'm not having this. No, thank you. See you later. Bye. I'm healed. Go away. You know, um, that I'm simplifying it, but we still have that ability. So none of it is still from a position of authority. Amen. Uh, so those are those are the main tactics. Uh, again, just to repeat them, temptations, distractions, deceptions, offenses. Oh, and, and, and get this. When you're talking about the distractions and the temptations, what he's really targeting is our flesh. You see what I'm saying? Those temptations and those distractions, he goes to appeal after. You know, the Bible talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Amen. Those are the cornerstones of our struggle in this world as far as with this flesh. And that's what he aims to go after. Um, and then you talk about the, 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 the attacking your health and finances. Bible says he came to steal, kill, and destroy if we let him. Amen? So anyway, now there are four primary ways that I'm going to talk about in, as it relates to how we fight this battle. Um, and here they are. Uh, one way is resisting Satan. Amen? It's, it's, it's more of a defensive posture. Resisting Satan. The other way is to attack Satan, amen, to be aggressive, to go on the offensive. Okay, that's another uh, method of fighting the enemy. Uh, and all of them are appropriate, as we'll see. Uh, prayers and supplications and watchings um, persistently. I, those things are about, I believe, being pre preparation, getting ready, understanding what's going on, listening for God to tell you how you may need to move and navigate. Amen. Uh, and then the last thing is, is, is this is very important. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but us not leaving doors open, wide open for the enemy to be able to come in and get us. If we keep the doors closed, it's that much harder for him to come at us. Amen. If you got the door wide open, the enemy can walk right through that door. So there are things that we have to do to keep the door open. That's going to be something we probably will talk about later on down the line. Uh, so those are the four primary ways. Again, resisting Satan. There's nothing offensive about that. It's, you know, you're not, and, and the other is offensively, aggressively going after him. Those are two totally different things. And no, it's not about being passive, as we're going to see. It's not about being passive and just, oh, I'm going to just sit back and let him take his blows. That's not what it is. Um, and we're going to see that some more. And then prayers and supplications. Uh, and then don't leave the door open. So now let's get into it. How do we fight this war? <clears throat> so I'm going to start reading here verse 10. I'm going to read all the way through this, uh, and then we'll kind of go through it. So it says here, starting in verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or tricks of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, or therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, uh, and on your feet, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you may quench the fiery darts of the wicked, that, uh, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So that's a mouthful. There is actually a lot in there. Now, Toya talked about this last time. Um, I'm going to touch on some of the same things, but then I'm going to um, expound on it a little bit more. Amen. Um, so now the first question that rises, how do we use these weapons? So we got here the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod or covered with the preparation of the gospel of peace, your loins girt about with truth, um, your helmet of salvation, the shield of, the, uh, the shield of faith, and then the sword of the spirit. Um, how do we use 
these weapons. This is the point of this class, is how do we effectively use these weapons. You want to learn how to use the weapons or refresh your memory on how to use the weapons? Amen. All right, so um, uh, so first thing is, the, the, there are what I'm going to call two sets of weapons here. Uh, the shield, or excuse me, the, the breastplate of righteousness, feet covered with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the loins girded about with truth, the helmet of salvation, uh, and, and the shield of faith. Shield of faith kind of has dual purpose. But those five uh, pieces of armor that we fight with are more of the defensive type of weapons, things that you use to protect yourself. Y'all see what I'm saying? The other two, the sword of the spirit and prayers and, 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 and watchings, and I'm going to add in there the shield of faith has a part of this too, are, are more of the offensive where we go on the offensive and we go after Satan and we go to attack him. Amen. So those are the two main categories of these weapons. And you need to know that to know how to properly use them, know when to use them. Amen. Most of the weapons are defensive weapons. That's interesting. Most of the, the pieces of armor, I'm going to say, I'm saying weapons. Most of the pieces of armor are about protecting yourself. The offensive weapons are prayer and the word, basically, and faith. Amen. So uh, let's deal with the, the, the defensive weapons today. Um, these weapons, I believe, are weapons that we are supposed to use to do the first area that we said these four ways to battle Satan. Resistance was the first one. And it's through these weapons, these pieces of armor that we resist the enemy with, as you'll see. Um, so uh, and, 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 and look, it says it right here. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. Now, that's another thing, that word stand. Uh, and later on, it says withstand. Those words are a word that means resist. Um, so it means to, re to withstand, to resist, and to oppose. So, again, it's not just, that's why I said earlier, it's not about sitting back and let him just take your blows, take his blows and hit you and punch you up all upside the head. That is not what it's saying. Because he said, resist him, oppose him. You see what I'm saying? So there, it, it's not just sitting there getting beat up. But as we're going to see, it's really more about protecting yourself to make sure that he cannot hurt us. Amen? Amen. Um, so now one, a couple of things we need to know about resisting. James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist, we were talking about that earlier, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, first thing you need to see there is if we resist, eventually, dude, we're going to scoot on. You see what I'm saying? So again, it's not that you're just sitting there taking blows. Your resistance actually produces results whereby he ends up leaving you alone. Amen? Now go over to Luke chapter 4. Um, because while I'm saying he's going to resist you, what I don't want you to think I'm saying is, you go, or excuse me, while I'm saying he's going to flee from you, I don't want you to, to leave you thinking that I'm saying he's going to leave once you resist and he won't be back because that's not the case. Um, Luke chapter 4, you there? All right, so uh, verse 13. So this is about the temptation when Satan came to tempt Jesus in the wilderness. Amen. And he went through his processes, his three different things that he tried to tempt Jesus with. And, of course, he did not have success. Amen. Uh, and so uh, look at verse 13 after he, his last little temptation against uh, Jesus. This is what it says. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Now, that means that, yeah, he, you resist the devil, he will flee. But it's only for a season. He'll come back later on. 
So you need to be aware of that. Don't think if you resist him one time, he is gone. Yeah, that's not true. He will be back. Amen. He'll be back and he'll be coming to try you again. Amen. So that's the first thing we need to know about this again. Um, is that we use these weapons to resist the devil. This is something we are called to do. Uh, now let's go on to uh, how to use these uh, 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 I'll keep saying weapons. How to use this armor to resist the enemy. All right, so first thing I want to do, you're talking about the breastplate of righteousness. You're talking about right here, right? What's behind there is your heart. Amen? All of the, what we're going to see here is all of these pieces that I mentioned, they're all protecting vital organs, and they're all based on the word. This is part of what Toya talked about. It's how each one of them had their roots in the word of God. Um, so you think about the breastplate of righteousness protecting our hearts. Thy word have I hid in my that I might not sin against you. So when Satan's coming to try to tempt you to sin, if you got on that the word of God, it will help protect your heart from being attacked by the enemy. Uh, your helmet of salvation is talking about it, it's, that to me is related to your mind. Amen. We renew the, our minds by what? How do we renew our minds? The word of God. Amen. We renew our minds based on the word of God with the word of God. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Order my steps in your. Anybody? Word. Amen. Order my steps in your word. Um, and in the loins. So I looked it up. Uh, when they were using this type of word back in the, the days when this was written, the, 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 the Greek and Aramaic, what they were talking about was your core, your center. I believe it's talking about what's, what's at the center of us. It's our spirit. Amen. And uh, our spirit is renewed by the word of God. So it's all it, it is all related to the word of God. Um, and it's there to protect our spirits, our hearts, our minds, our, you know, the path that we take. We're talking about order my steps in your word. Unless we're going to stay in our house our entire life, you're going to be going some places. Amen. And it behooves us to have the Lord guide us where we go, because one of the things is he can cause us to avoid danger by warning us. Amen. So you see what I'm saying? It's important to have them steps ordered by the Lord. Amen. So uh, 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 these things are based on the word. And now what does that mean? That means we got to get the word in us. How many of you know that if you do not have the word in you, and, and, and I'm choosing this word carefully, the word in us. You can know the word. But there's a difference between knowing the word and having it deep down on the inside of you. You know, one of the ways you can tell, I use this to judge myself, and I think it says a lot about us, period. When something happens, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Okay, let's say, um, uh, let's say you start having trouble with one of your kids, okay? One of your kids giving you trouble. They're in school and they're giving you trouble. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? With me, it's not necessarily get the belt out. My first thought is, okay, this ain't how my children are supposed to be. My children, we are raising them up in the Lord, teaching them the way to walk, how to have a relationship with God. That's the promise that God has given us. That's the charge he's given us and a right that we have to expect. So I'd, if we train up a child in the way you should go, when they're older, they will not depart. I expect my children to not depart. So when my child starts going wayward, I have to remind myself, no, he said if we train up our child in the way he or she should go, when they're old, they will not depart. They will. Maybe they'll stray a little bit, but I believe they will be back. They, they're not going to escape too far. Even the prodigal son who went out and messed up, he came back home. You see what I'm saying? When he finally came to an end of himself and realized the mess he was in, what was his thought? I got to go back home. 
This ain't how I'm supposed to be living. You see what I'm saying? So um, that's my expectation. But So my point is, what comes to your mind when things happen? If you start having trouble, you know, okay, let's say you get laid off from a job. Are you immediately going to panic or what's the first thought come to your mind? Okay, I lost this one. The Lord will provide. He'll have a ram in the bush. He's got something planned for me. You see what I'm saying? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? That's how you know you got it deep down inside. It's not about knowing the scriptures. It's about having it deep down inside. Now, that means you got to spend some time in the word, a good amount of time in the word. Amen. To get it deep down inside. You are not going to get it deep down inside. Read, read through it. You know, let's say, uh, uh, you know, two times through the whole Bible. And that's all the time you spend. You read only on Sundays when you go to church, only on Wednesdays when you go to Bible study. You're not going to get it deep down inside that way. You got to be taking it in yourself. Amen. Um, the, G. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart. Talk, I mentioned that earlier. That means he's putting that deep down inside. Amen. Um, the Bible in, in Joshua says we should meditate on the word day and night. Amen. So we are supposed to spend a good amount of time in the word. I will never forget the class Noel did. Um, and he was talking about renewing our mind. And I probably have mentioned this before, but I thought he made such a great analogy. He talked about when we want our kids to grow up and become successful, we make sure they go to school. And they go to school five days a week, six, seven hours a day. Plus, they come home and do homework. Then after they graduate from high school, we want them all to go to college, get some more education. Four, five more years, six more years, whatever it's going to be. We, and, and they spend hours in school, especially in, in you know, pro, you know uh, kindergarten and 12th grade, days. Imagine how far more far ahead we'd be if we spent that much time in the word. Which one is going to give us the most success? Our natural education or the word of God? The word of God. I'm not resisting natural education. You need a natural education. Amen. So I'm not dismissing that at all. I'm not minimizing it. But it is not more effective than the word of God. So he said that class was phenomenal. His point is, if you treated your spiritual growth and your spiritual renewing your mind the same way you do your natural education we'd all be so much further ahead you know what i'm saying so i'm just saying we need to spend time in the word y'all feel me amen um get it deep down inside um okay so um uh, the other thing about it, uh, how we use this, uh, uh, so I said that, okay, so the shield of faith, the only other different one that I talked about, I said it has a little bit of both, but when you think about it, first of all, the shield of faith, uh, we are, what we have in faith in is the word of God, amen, whether it's written or spoken, we have faith in the word of God, that is our foundation, amen, so even the shield of faith is important. Uh, in this battle, and it does help us. The Bible says that with this shield of faith, you quench the fiery darts of the devil, the things that he's throwing at us. He quenches it. And I'm going to even go this far as to say, when you talk about the breastplate, loins girded about with truth, feet showered, pressure, preparation of gospel peace, helmet of salvation, they're all protecting your physical body, the important components anyway. Amen. Right? Uh, shield of faith. So those things cover your core parts of your being. Shield of faith covers everything else. Outside of that, my arm might be a little exposed, but you got the shield of faith there. You see what I'm saying? My leg might be a little exposed, but I got the shield of faith here. So if God covered everything, we got what we need in the word if we take it and use it. Amen? Um, so now what I want to do, let's say, if y'all still in Luke chapter 4? All right. So what we're going to do, Jesus is going to be our example uh, of how we use these weapons. And, yeah, some of it is kind of new, but, I mean, is, you've heard it before, but, again, we eating that good dinner again. Amen. All right, Jesus, I'm going to start at verse 1. No, I won't start at 1. Y'all know what this is. He ended up in the wilderness fasting for 40 days, and while he was out there, Satan tempted him. Amen. 
Um, so I'm, I am going to start verse 2. It says, being 40 days tempted of the devil, uh, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterwards hungered. Uh, and verse 3, and the devil said to him, if you be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. So first thing you realize here, uh, he comes in to trick him, basically to cause doubt. Are you really the son of God? You see what I'm saying? If you be the son of God, he's trying to cause doubt right there, right off the bat. If you are the son of God, did y'all catch his folk bonnets too? If you be the son of God. Um, if you are the son of God, is what he said. He's called, first thing he's doing is trying to cause him to doubt. Um, then he tell him, told him, command these stones that they be made bread. So now he's trying to appeal to his flesh, the lust of the flesh. You know, these bodies want to eat. I like to eat. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Uh, He's appealing to the lust of the flesh. So that's what he, so two things went on there. He's trying to cause doubt in his mind. And then he's appealing to the lust of his flesh. Do you realize, I, I got to see if God is going to let me say this later. Do you realize that Jesus had a flesh just like you and me? Yes. Hey, okay, that, that's as far as I'm going to take that right now. He had a flesh just like you and I. He tried to appeal to his flesh. That's his, his tactic. Now, let's see how Jesus responded. And Jesus answered him saying, it is written. It is written. He's talking about the word of God. That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, the first thing we need to take away from here is he spoke the word to the temptation. Okay, there was a temptation. Satan didn't attack him. He's trying to trick them into something. Cause doubt, give in to your flesh. Satan's response was to quote the word, speak the word. But it wasn't just speak the word. He spoke a word that was specifically related to the temptation. You see, that's important too. Satan trying to tempt you to eat some food when you're supposed to be fasting. You can't be walking around the house talking about the Lord is my healer. Well, yeah, that don't work. By his stripes, I am healed. Well, what has that got to do with anything? He spoke a word specifically related to the temptation that he was going through. Amen? Y'all see that? That's important. It's not just any random word, but you need to know word based on what you're being tempted with. That's really, really important. Amen? That's really important. Um, okay, so that was his response. He's response. He spoke the word and then uh, and it was related to that. Um, so uh, and I'm going to tell you another thing. W one of the things you're going to see in this as we go through this. Satan is coming at him. Trying to get him off his, his, his square. Right. You'll notice in here, Jesus never attacked Satan. He, in these situations, he never went at him. He didn't rebuke him and tell him, go back to hell. He didn't take authority over him. All he did was resist. I told y'all, this first part is about resisting. You see what I'm saying? And he resisted using the word. Satan tried to cause doubt in his mind and tried to go after his flesh, the lust of the flesh. And he used the weapon, the word. Amen. So. Um, so, yeah, like I said, that's 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 pretty big. Um, now, the next thing I'll stop there. So the next thing it says. Verse five, it says, and the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Uh, and the devil said to him. Uh, and the word, uh, excuse me, and where am I at here? Uh, and the devil said to him, all this power, no, I'm sorry, yeah. All this power will I give to you and the glory of them for that it was delivered to me 
<coughs> to whosoever I will, I will give it. So he takes him up to a mountain, shows him the world, and he says, hey, as of right now, these are in my possession. I can give them to you. Now, there's a couple things about this. So first thing, well, so no, before I do that, let's do this. Uh, and in verse 7, he says, if you will worship me, all shall be yours. So first thing he did, so what did he appeal to there? Because he didn't appeal to the flesh necessarily, but he did appeal to something. And then he tried to get him to sin, which was to worship him. What he appealed to, and this is this was very interesting. I had never seen this before. And this is why this was an issue for Jesus. He tempted him to give him control of the world. Well, guess what? Jesus came into the world. It was prophesied that he would rule the world. It's all his anyway. You see what I'm saying? It's all his. But why does Satan try and come at him and tell him, I will give this to you? See, Satan don't get the big picture. He just didn't get it. Okay, that's the problem. But he, but in a way he did, because this is why this was an issue. In order to G, get G, or excuse me, in order for Jesus to step into this place where he was ruling the world, he had to go through some things. There were things that he had to accomplish. You see what I'm saying? He was sent here with a purpose. And once he fulfilled that purpose, then that means everything in this world he has conquered. And the Bible says the last thing that had to be conquered was death. Okay, so he came to conquer, but he had to go through some things before he can get to that place. He had to go through three years of ministry, of witnessing the people, telling people about the good news of, God, of the gospel. He had to go through uh, three years of dealing with people's sicknesses and ailments and people demon-possessed. And y'all know people, y'all, we can be a mess. He had to deal with that on a daily basis. Amen. Then he had to go through this whole uh, uh, death, the beatings and the scourgings and the ridicule. Amen. And the nails through the hands and all that stuff he went through and dying on the cross. He had to go through those things. Well, he could have simply worshipped Satan and he'd have got it because it was in Satan's control at that time. So he had it easy out. That would have been a much easier way to get to where he was trying to get, where he needed to get to, where it was prophesied that he would get to. See, that's why. So he could have, so instead of him taking the correct route, the long route, the painful route, he could have taken the easy route. Y'all get it? Well, that's what he was appealing to. Uh, in other words, say, I know what you got to go through. I'm going to try and get you off, off that path. I'll still give you what you want. And Jesus could have been tempted, or I ain't no could have been. Jesus there was a temptation there for him to take that path. Amen. So and then all he had to do was worship Satan. So with that being said, that's what he went after this time around. And then what was his response? Jesus answered and said in verse eight, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, for it is written, for it is written, for it is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So once again, the resistance, what well, he resisted by simply quoting the word, speaking the word. Um, that's important. Uh, and then the last one here, uh, verse 9, it says, And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of a temple and said to him, or the temple, and said to him, If you be the son of God, so first he's question, got him doubting again, trying to get him off his you know, game, forget who you are. Maybe you ain't who you said you are. If you be the son of God, any bonnets, cast yourself down from hence, for it is written, now Satan quoting the word, right? For it is written, he will give his angels charge over you to keep you. And in their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. So now again, he's going to cause doubt. And now here he's trying to get him to a place where, hmm, I can be a little prideful. Yeah, I can do that. I'm the man. I can jump down. I can fall down from here and nothing's going to happen. I, I think that's going after a little bit of this whole pride of life thing. Uh, so that's what he appealed to. And then he, he tried to get him to tempt God, to test God. And of course, what was Jesus' response? Uh, for it is written. 
Oh, excuse me. That's not where I was. And Jesus answered unto him and said, it is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. So you see, he spoke the word of God to resist these temptations. He did not attack him or assail him. He just did not. That's not what he did. He resisted by speaking the word. This is the posture of resisting. Amen. To oppose, to set yourself against. Amen. Um, so uh, I, I think that what I'm going to do now, you guys on your paper. So again, let me recap here. The point here is in this phase of our warfare, it's about resisting the enemy. Amen. And we resist the enemy with that word. Amen. Um, so what I'm going to do here, I, I think this is what we're going to do. So uh, you guys have a sheet. For those of you who have a sheet, an uh, 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 outline, you have this. If not, you guys can do it in your phone or pull something out. But I want to give us, uh, take this last 15 minutes and give us, uh, an exercise. Um, actually, before I do this, so let me go on and say this. I've been, I've been trying to see if God was okay with this, and I believe he is. So I want to go back to the whole temptation with Jesus. Um, and the reason this is important is because we really need to realize how effective this is. We really need, it's essential. And Jesus gave us the example of why it's essential. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to use me for an example. There ain't nobody in this world that could ever come to me and tempt me to use smoke, to, uh, to uh, sniff cocaine. Okay, it'll never happen. You can't tempt me with that. Now, the person can come and try to tempt me. But what I'm telling you is, I wasn't tempted. I would not be tempted. I'm saying I wouldn't. It's never happened. I would not be tempted. Okay, now there may be other areas where I'd be tempted, but that's not an area. My point is, for you to be tempted, it has to be something that you would actually seriously consider doing. That's when it's a temptation. Just because somebody come and, comes and offers you something or tries to talk you into something, they're being a tempter, but you haven't been tempted. Now, why do I bring this up? It says, let's go here. <coughs> Verse five, and the devil taking him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. <clears throat> and then verse nine, and he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. I need you to see this. Uh, so. How in the world did Satan. Take him up on the pinnacle of a temple or take him up to a mountain. Satan can't just pick somebody up and move them somewhere. Now, we know that he can get in. He can influence people by talking to them and telling them to do something. He can possess some people and make them do some things, unsaved people particularly. But I can assure you Jesus wasn't possessed, right? Um, and do I think Jesus, based, based on the fact that Jesus resisted when Satan tried to tell him to, fall off this, you know, jump off this temple and see if you hurt yourself. He ain't just out here tempting God. So I don't think Satan was, or Jesus was following Satan just because he wanted to, uh, you know, uh, prove this out. Or, or he did it because he was tempted. That's what I'm trying. I'm, I'm working my way toward, toward showing you that Jesus was tempted just like you and I get tempted. Um, let's go to Hebrews chapter four. <clears throat> so when it says Satan took him up there, he willingly went. And, and your question would be, why would you do that? Again, Hebrews chapter four. And I'm submitting to you is because for a brief moment, he was tempted. <laughs> it reminds me of something. But anyway, uh, verse 15, Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. Uh, <clears throat> for we have not a priest talking well actually let's read 14 seeing then that we have a great high priest 
that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was tempted the same way. That means there was something within him that considered, uh, was seriously, he was tempted. Not that Satan, it wasn't just that Satan tempted him. He was tempted. There was a part of him that was trying, that was considering raising up and going some of these routes. Maybe I could take the easy routes. And all I got to do is say, okay, Satan, I worship you. And I got control of everything. There was a temptation there. Otherwise, he wouldn't have willingly went. So that's important. Um, and there's another verse. Actually, we'll go there. Chapter 2. Stay, stay in Hebrews. Go to chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> verse 18 says, For in that he himself suffered being tempted, so my Jesus, he is able to help them that are tempted. In other words, because he went through what we have to go through, it enabled him to help us that much more. You see what I'm saying? So that's one of the reasons why he had to come for him to be able to help us the way we needed to be helped. He had to go through what we go through. So and I say this is this is important because we need to realize. Jesus could have gotten knocked off his horse if he didn't stick to his guns, if he didn't, because Jesus was not in this worth uh, earth just as full blown God. He was in this flesh just like us. Amen. And so. He could have got knocked off his horse, and if he hadn't stuck to his guns, absorbed that word in him. Remember, he was 12 years old in the temple with the priest, talking with, about the word of God to him. He was about the word. Then he could have gotten knocked off his horse if he wasn't about. That much more, if Jesus being the only begotten son of God, the firstborn, had to know the word to survive these temptations from the enemy, we need to know the word. You see what I'm saying? That's how real this is. That's how real this is. All right, so now, that being said, let's, I'm going to give you four areas, and I want you all to think about a word, the word, some scripture that applies to this situation. Same thing for you guys online. I'm reading these, and I want you to think about scriptures that apply to these. Uh, and you, can, you don't have to do them all. You can do them all. At least pick one that might be a little bit relevant to something you've gone through or are going through. So here you go. Satan will come at us to distract us. Amen. Uh, to put us in a place where we doubt whether or not we can be effective in ministry. Now, that's important because y'all don't realize we up here. I stand up here to minister the word of God. Y'all Tracy gets up here. Noel gets up here. Tori gets up here. We get up here to minister the word of God. I'm telling you all, from experience, it ain't always easy. You do sometimes go through doubt. Me and Tracy just talked about that. We go through doubt sometimes. Am I really doing a good job with this? Is God really working through me? Then we start comparing ourselves to somebody else. Think about how such and such does it. Think about this person, that guy we see on TV. We start comparing ourselves. Then sometimes those questions come. That's the enemy coming to try to cause you to doubt whether or not you can be effective in ministry. It's coming to cause me to try, try to make me doubt. And I have gone through it in everything that I've done in the kingdom of God, from leading praise and worship to being over youth ministry when we first started, to being on the evangelism team, to ministering deliverance, all of it. And doubt has tried to creep in. The enemy was trying to get me off my square. So this is real. Um, uh, so again... He will try to distract us by causing us to doubt whether or not we can be effective. Uh, another thing, to get out ahead, uh, uh, he'll try and tempt us to get out ahead of God, uh, to go into whatever it is he has called you to do before it's time. In other words, he may have a plan for you. As soon as you get revelation, it's easy to get revelation on something. God tells you something he called you to do. Yeah, you kind of ready to say, okay, I can do that. Initially, you kind of ready. Oh, yeah, I'm going to jump two feet. And then if you don't get the opportunity, you might get mad and say, okay, you know what? Forget this. I'm going somewhere else where I can find some place to minister. Where they'll let me go minister and do what I got to do. He'll try and tempt us to get out ahead of God. That door might not be open yet. Okay? 
So it behooves us to, even though he may show you what you got to do, take your time, let God open the door. You see what I'm saying? So that's another thing. Um, distractions, another type of distraction is offenses. And guys, offenses, it's, it's, it's a big deal. Getting offended. Um, now, offenses. Somebody offending you. Let me, let me say this. Okay, I can re you can rest assured, every single one of you guys in here, somebody is going to offend you in the church. I may have offended some of y'all in here. I certainly didn't mean it, but I can guarantee you, I'm sure I've offended some people in here. I'm sorry. Uh, somebody is going to offend you. But guess what? You're going to offend somebody too. I just want to... Put that in your mind, too. I can assure you. That's one of the things that I, had to, I have had. If I told y'all some of the things that have been said to me over the years, y'all would really wonder why I'm still doing this thing. I'll just say that. Uh, there have been some offenses, some offended, offensive statements made to me. Uh, but I am not going to let that get me off my square. And the first thing I had to do was remind myself, yeah, okay, well, guess what? You done offended some people, too. Keep on moving. Keep on moving. Realize that the Bible, oh, no, I don't want to give you no verses. Okay, anyway, people going to mess up is my point. Y'all get it? Last one. Uh, he'll deceive us by making us think that nobody likes you. Now, this is a big one, too. How many people will not step into what God has for them because they think don't nobody like them? I've had, con I, I ain't calling no names. I remember having a conversation with somebody recently. They ain't been doing what they used to do because they think just this, that somebody, people don't like them. It will stop you from doing what God has called you to do because you just simply think somebody don't like you. And, and anyway, nine times out of ten, it ain't true. And for that one time that it is true, <laughs> okay, so somebody don't like you, right? Okay. The first one won't be the last one. Um, and then, okay, I said one more. Tempts us sometime with a great job offer. Comes along. Pa Pastor Taylor mentioned this. Job offer comes, all, comes along. You can make all kind of money and do all kind of things and go to another level and so on and so forth. But it's really getting you off. And I do know people who have gotten off by chasing a career. Um, it happens. And so the distraction has come by the enemy to offer you all this money in this position. Think of at least one of those while we got a few minutes, some scripture, if that happens, that you will quote against it. Do I need to read them again? Y'all got them written down. Look at them real quick. If you didn't already, come on, write it down, write your scripture. You ain't got to remember book, chapter, and verse. Just write what it says down. Practice using the word to resist this temptation. Amen. <clears throat> So, uh, yeah, take your time to do that. <clears throat> Online, y'all do the same thing. made some progress. You got at least one of them. All right. So I'm going to just tell you what I'm not going to ask everybody to, to, to I might ask a few people. Okay. I mean, I'm not going to do mine first. So give me somebody who's willing to tell me what, what you came up with. Anybody. I ain't going to call no names. Good. Thank you, Daryl. What you got? Okay. Oh, yeah, why, why, why is she, I'm over here serving, 
and she's over here sitting at your feet. Mm -hmm. And so that, that scripture is going to help you fight, resist the enemy. So what part of it? Because she said, because Jesus told her, no, Mary has chosen the, the, the needful part. So you remember Mary chose what was needful. So y'all, he mentioned the story in Luke with Mary and Martha, how they were with Jesus and Martha was all busy and everything and she complained. Why isn't Mary doing some work too? And Jesus' response was, Mary has chosen the needful part. She needs to be sitting here at my feet, learning from me, listening to me. Daryl saying he would use that when it comes to distraction. No, I can't do that. I got to do the needful thing. Thank you, Daryl. That's good. Uh, who else? Okay, Tracy, what you got? Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, yeah, very good. So online, uh, she went from the one about being tempted with a good job and her scripture is where it says, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's what she would use to resist. If she knows that job ain't from God and is trying to get her off track and off focus, this is the word she's going to quote saying, no, my God, I ain't got to worry about all that money you offer me. My God will supply all my needs. One more. Give me one more. Okay, go ahead, D. Farrell. Oh, okay. <laughs> Slow to wrath. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Huh? And not, yeah, not retaliate. So online, yeah, he quoted uh, uh, James where it says, uh, James, is that where it is? Yeah. yeah. James where it said, um, uh, say it again. No, I just lost it. It left me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where it says, be swift to hear, slow to uh, speak, and slow to wrath. If somebody's coming to, and, and they offend him, his, his scripture to resist that, wanting to retaliate, is to say, I'm going to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Okay, so that's very good. <laughs> amen, amen. No, that's very good, though. That's very good. You see how you can use these words to fight this battle to resist the enemy? I, I, I'll do one um, where, because uh, I told you, I have... All throughout my time with God, anytime I've gotten in any type of ministry, I've had to deal with these doubts. Well, uh, I'll deal with praise and worship, for example. Uh, I went through, boy, I went through some major doubts for years, years. I'm saying it would come and go. I, things be going well, then all of a sudden I'm hit with this major doubt again. And then it'd be, I'd get past it, and then I'd be, get hit with this major doubt again. But this is what I kept doing. Once I heard from God, that he, where he told me that he had called me to do praise and worship, that was it. You know, in Timothy it says, he, uh, Paul told Timothy that you need to war a good warfare with the prophecies that went before on you. So what I did when that doubt was trying to come was I would speak, no, the Lord has said he has called me to be a worship leader, and so I am a worship leader. I'm not trying to be Donnie McClurkin. You see what I'm saying? Or Marvin Winans or Israel Houghton. I'm trying to be David, the worship leader. This is what I would say. This is what God has called me to do. So I use the word to resist that doubt. And believe me, the doubt comes. Tracy, you feel me? Clifton, you feel me? Has the doubt ever come? Oh, shut up. You're lying, so. <laughs> See, I know our conversation, so. <laughs> Mm 
Oh, you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Go ahead. We're a few minutes over, y'all. So sorry. Go ahead. So the running not go weary and mount over wings angel eagles. That's about. I can be patient. I can wait this thing out. Yes. Yeah. So y'all online, he was talking about the. This was Clifton. He was talking about the one where he tried to tempt you to get out ahead of God and and run before Him and get into something when it ain't time. And he used the scripture that says, "I will mount over wings as eagles. I will run and not go weary. Weary. I will walk and not faint." That scripture tells him, no, I can be patient and wait this out until God does it. That's very good. You see what I'm saying? So these are the things we need to do with the word to resist the enemy. This is the portion of our warfare where we have to resist the enemy. This is a form of fighting. Now, later on when I'm back, I think I won't be back until May. I'm, I think I'm going to pick up on how to go on the attack or one of the other ones. Uh, we'll see. But... Uh, this is what I felt led to talk about tonight. Resisting is not being a punk. Resisting is not just laying down and taking it. Amen. There is some some uh, work you got to do, and it's effective because he will flee from you. You can expect that if you resist, he will flee from you. Now, if you don't resist, then he ain't going to flee. That means you're going to stay there and have a ball. You see what I'm saying? Okay, praise the Lord. We're done. Thank you.